Hi guys, welcome back to Into the Light, a different light story, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host Stefan Neff. Today's another cool day for an interview and I've got Dawn <laughs> Mensch with me. Uh, it is exciting because Dawn is an, an author and not just any author. I mean, you know, a lot of people that I interviewed, they've got one book out there and yeah, right. Dawn was was a bit of an overachiever there. Um, so once she got going, you couldn't stop her, and you still can't. And it, she's a powerhouse. And um, um, I'm so grateful that I've got Dawn today on because she uh, is talking to us about essentially teaching and the the fact that teaching we sort of have got in mind it needs to be powerpoint deaf by powerpoint or deaf by classes so and that is not how many of us really truly learn so there are other ways how one can learn and sometimes it, the, the best learning happens when you don't even know that you're learning that's exactly what dawn's books are all about so that's actually really really cool to talk to her about it and here her own story of transformation, and uh, more excitingly, you know, where is this story going? Uh, here's a woman on a path, and and I think we all can learn where a path from darkness can suddenly lead into. So, Dawn Mensch, I'm so pleased to have you on board. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to speak to your audience. Oh, beautiful. And you have got here just, you know, a beautiful uh, little uh, display there. I'm um, blown away. What was your very first book? What was the first one that, that you wrote? Well, we'll kind of start at the beginning. Um, I teach students with severe cognitive delays, and I've been doing it for over 20 years. And part of getting my credential, I took a math class. And our assignment was to write a math book and to create a math game. So that is what I did. And that is this one, Queen Vernita's Visitors. But when I first started it, it was actually called Queen Victoria. And it had my students in it because I was teaching. And we actually made it into a little skit and we traveled around to elementary schools. And my students did skits for the first and second graders and the kindergartners. And then I would go back the next day and I would explain some of their behaviors and what they're doing and their disabilities. So then I had to get divorced and there was some domestic violence. So my choice in that was to publish my book. So what I did was I changed it to Vernita, who was my grandmother. And she was an astute uh. businesswoman who actually went with her father door to door and got members and created a credit union. So she was an astute businesswoman and a world traveler. She was the, the uh, monarch of our family. So I create, I named it after her. And everybody in the book is someone, a child in our family. This is my nephew. And this is, <laughs> this is my daughter, Ashley. And I have my son in here. And this is, this is my niece. So at that time, I thought, okay, you know, they're the kids in the family. They won't complain. You know, they won't. And so I did that. And then I started getting awards. I immediately won first place in the EV Award, which is an independent publisher. And I started getting interviews. And people started asking me, like, well, what are you going to do next? You know, what? And I'm like, no, I don't know. Like, that was all I was doing. I just wanted to publish the book. You know, teachers love to publish the book. So I did that. And so I actually decided then that the queen was going to travel around her kingdom and learn about the different areas because I love to travel. So that way I can incorporate the love of traveling um, into my books. And that's easy, it's a good excuse to travel too. And so everyone in my books is a real person in my life. And most of them are based on my family and our trips together. So that's actually how it started. So then the next one I did was this one, and it's on Alaska. I've been to Alaska like three times, and I went once with my grandmother and once with my son, and I travel a lot with my mom. And so in this one, my mom and I, I like to make her do, do things. <laughs> so we were in Sitka, Alaska, and I wanted to go snorkeling. 
So we went snorkeling in Sitka, Alaska, and we had to wear a dry suit to keep us warm enough, you know, so that we didn't freeze in the water. And we also went and we saw, of course, the whales and then um, the eagles. This one is actually me and my grandma in the book. But we kayak to the glaciers. And so all of that is in this book. And so I did that one. And then this one, this one is my little brother. He's an astronomer up here at JPL, which is a research laboratory. Um, I live in the mountains. And so he helped me write this book. And his name is Heath. But when he was little, we called him Heathy Bean. So he is Sir Heathy Bean in the book. And he wanted to have the wild hair and the bunny slippers. So that is what he has. So he goes through and he teaches. It's a every my books are all formatted. Each page is a new a subject or a thought. And then then there are seven facts. So they all have the same format because the first one was based on calendar skills, days of the week, months of the years, and seasons. It's pre-K to first grade. So then they go they go all the way up to sixth grade. It matters what the content is that we're teaching. And so it has a new planet and then seven facts. But his friends, he has the wild hair and the bunny slippers. Okay, so this friend is Jake and Jake is a real person and he has cerebral palsy. And so um, I think that's what, yes, he has cerebral palsy. And so he's kind of telling Heath, Sir Heathy Bean, a little bit about what he has. Oh, and then excellent. this one, this excellent. one, this one, this is a little boy I had. And he has Down syndrome and he was my student for years. And so he's teaching the queen seven facts about Down syndrome. And it's just, it's a little snippet of a disability. So you're not overwhelmed by it. It's not like the whole book is about that. You just get a little snippet and Jeremy is a real person. And so, um, and he's, he's out having a picnic and he's having, a, you know, his life. And so you're just learning things about the disabilities in between the planets and everything else that you're learning. And so if that interests you, then you will go and look at more information. Or if you know someone has Down syndrome, then you know a little bit more about them. And you know that they like to be out in the big world and they like doing the same kinds of things that we all like to do. And um, so this is just another one of the characters and this is a real person too. And so that was one of my books. And what I did, my series has won 41 awards. Uh, well, actually more now, because I just won some more. But what I did, I like to do things differently. Uh, at one point, I, this is, a, this is another part where there's kind of a little darkness in the, in the journey. Um, but I actually was stalked for several years by somebody very dumb. <laughs> and I was um, getting very, I don't know, just discouraged and tired and depressed. And the one thing I did is I joined the Society of Book Writers and Illustrators. And that was one of the most positive things I ever did for myself. Uh, I was surrounded by um, really good people and they were very supportive. And it didn't matter if they were New York Times bestselling authors or they were people who hadn't even had the, you know, had gone out and actually tried to publish. And everybody was so nice and encouraging, but I saw at the end of one of the conferences, you know, we were really tired and my mom had come with me and she was waiting for me. But there was a, a lecture at the end and I, I'm like, okay, I want to stay for this. And I actually had to sit in the back of the room. It was packed with like 1500 people. So I had to sit on the floor in the back to watch it. But his name was Kwame Alexander and he uh, writes middle grade uh, poems, I think is what he writes. But he gave a speech, speech and he talked about how he, you know, before he, you know, now they're making a movie a movie for him, but um, how he was self-published and how, you know, this didn't work and that didn't work. And so that's the encouraging part because they didn't have an easy journey either. You know, they just kept going and going and going. But I was really discouraged. Um, and I listened to his speech and he said, say yes. So when you get an opportunity, you say yes to it. <laughs> and you don't know what that opportunity is going to lead to, to another one, to another one. So after winning all of these awards, I was on Facebook and I saw um, an ad for Conquering Disabilities with Film. 
And I thought, well, I've never done that. So let me try that. So I contacted um, the head of it and I said, can I enter my books? Because I don't write a script. <laughs> you know? I am not a script writer. And she said, yeah. So I did. So I entered my books and I won the Special Recognition Champion Award from the film festival. And then some of my book trailers are also winning awards. So in July, I'm going to go, they have a big film festival in Vegas. And so in July, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna receive my awards for written work and some of my video trailers. And it's gonna, it's gonna be red carpet and it's, Ooh. you know, there's gonna be a lot of movie people there. So it's gonna be very exciting. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it, but I would never be doing that if I had not just contacted her and just asked her, you know, can my can my books enter? Because you know they're not they're not for film. Well, hopefully they will be someday. But this is one of the books that I entered and I won. This little girl is Ireland, and her mom is Heather. Ireland has Rett syndrome, and she's a very real person. And so this book is actually based on Hawaii. I have a friend in Kona. And when I was getting divorced, I went there a lot. Like every six months, I would fly there and stay with him and his wife. She grew up in Kona. And it was a good way for me to feel, you know, to get better after the divorce and to feel better and to rejuvenate. And so I've actually written two books um, in Kona, but this is the one that I entered. And so she's giving everybody just seven facts. What she's doing is she's making lays. She's lacing the lays for her classmates. And so it's explaining why her mom has to help her and then what the disability is like for her and her mom. And I've actually done interviews with the mom. She came on with me on, a, on an interview and discussed her daughter and um, the journey that they're going through. And then this one, okay, first we'll do this one. Okay, this is Connor. Connor has autism and Connor, you're gonna love this part. His dad name is, his dad's name is Steve Neff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. I need to meet that guy. Okay. So <laughs> I want, I want a contact. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so this is him and his dad and he was a student of mine. Connor was, and Connor is nonverbal and he uses a communication device to talk to people. So here he is. He's discussing the communication device with Queen Bernita and they are at the, they're um, at the volcanic national park. Yeah. And so you're learning about the park, but you're also learning about the communication device and autism. So if you see someone when you're out and about and they're using a communication device, you will know, oh, that's what they're doing. You know, it's not they're not playing video games. You know, they're not doing that. They're using it to talk to you. And and they can actually they can understand you. They just can't speak. So um, it helps you with that. So then this page one okay this one I actually won a contest I used to play contests all the time you know people say no nobody ever wins yeah they did I was winning all the time but um so I won a trip to Hawaii and I took all of my children at that time I had one just one little granddaughter I wanted to go swimming with the sharks so I dragged everybody across the island. Yeah. And, you know, my boys were with us and, you know, they just really just didn't want to do that. <laughs> but we went in, we went 10 miles out and we were snorkeling inside a cage. And my daughter was standing at the top and she was feeding the sharks so they would come. So she got to see them like jumping out of the water and biting the, you know, the meat. And so she would not get in the cage. But I was in the cage with my sons. And the sharks were swimming around us and it was fascinating. It was so neat. And we wanted to like touch the sharks and stuff. And, you know, it wasn't like a life threatening or anything, but it was a lot of fun. And so this one, that's what this one is. So the other one, this is the one I did on Kona too. This is, I think this was the second, the third, maybe the third book I published. And this one is Sea Captain Jeff and Enchantress Carrie, who are my friends in um, Hawaii. And this is Sea Captain Jeff. And this little girl is also a real, a real person. Oh, and her name is Rhonda. And Rhonda has a here has um, she's deaf. Rhonda is deaf. Sorry, I published this one like ten years ago. <laughs> she's deaf, and so she's talking about that. And this tree, this tree is real, and it's a zebra bird, and it was in his front yard. So we talked about that in the story. And this one, this one was another little girl. Unfortunately, I don't know why we missed, she didn't get in the picture, but 
um, she actually was visually impaired. And so she's listening to the ocean sounds. And so it talks about her hearing and it talks about listening to the ocean. And so that again, is just a little bit of snippet of a disability. And in here, we went swimming in um, with the turtles. This is a, a real little girl. And we went swimming with the turtles and we went into a lava tube. When we were in Hawaii, there was, I think there must've been 19 of us. I actually flew my son and my kids over there my son got married on the beach and we went in, my friend uh, took us, you know, to the non-tourist places. And so we went down and hiked down into the bottom of a lava tube and went swimming at the bottom of it. And we were between, um, I think my youngest grandchild at that time might've been three. And the oldest one was in his seventies and we all went. And if you go on my, like on my Facebook and my Instagram, there are pictures of the actual photos of what we did. And that's what my illustrator does. She takes real pictures and real people and incorporates them into the illustration. And so if you go on like this photo album in my Facebook, you will see the pictures of our trip and what we were doing and like our real pictures of us down at the bottom of the lava tube. And so that was this one. Um, let's see, go in there. Okay, so. Do you have any questions or you want to keep going? <laughs> oh, no, it's it's absolutely stunning. And okay. it is what a beautiful, what a beautiful way how how to incorporate the the disabilities and learning about the disabilities into your books. I had recently a guest on my show who herself is a, dis a disabled um disabled parent and she supports other parents in their struggle and in their often beating themselves up why can't I be a normal mum yeah. and those kind of things and she mentioned in a side sentence her fear what will happen when actually the self-isolation of COVID is disappearing because during COVID everyone is on Zoom, everyone looks their best, everyone has a mask up, there are no <laughs> handicapped people, there are no disabled people. Um, how, sorry, whatever the, the correct term uh, in uh, politically or socially uh, correct terms are, please forgive me if I've chosen something wrong, but oh, the no. bottom line is everyone, everyone sort of shows their best and suddenly people come out there and there are people who look different and Everyone says, what the hell? Who are they? Uh, yeah. They have been all there in this, all the time in the society, but we haven't seen them. And so that was actually quite an intriguing thing. So for you to normalize disability is so beautiful. It's so beautiful to actually to see a true cross section of society just playing out and you learning about it in front of your eyes without you actually knowing to learn. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That's that's the beautiful thing that you have achieved there. And for that, every single bloody award you have won is <laughs> well and truly deserved, okay? Well, um, since we'll, we'll go on that track for a moment. Um, as I said, I teach students with severe cognitive delays. I've been doing it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And when, I don't know, it's it's been a little while now, but I was teaching in my own district that I grew up in. It's a small town. And I, we were in, I was in the third graduating class. My brother was in the first one, so it was very small. So when I came back to teach, my, my children graduated from the same high school I did, and I have grandchildren that are graduating. <laughs> and, but the one thing I did when I started teaching the students, because we have specialized classrooms. So when I started teaching my students in the same um, schools that I grew up in, I wanted them to have the same opportunities I had when I was growing up. And the one thing we did is, when we were in elementary school, we got to go snow skiing once, once a week. And so I wanted my students to have that opportunity. So what I did was I got grants and I did it. We did it for about four years, I believe. I got special grants and we went up to the ski slopes. There's several up where I live and they had adaptive ski lessons. And all of my students participated um, at whatever level they could. So I had students who were able to learn how to snowboard, which I could not do. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd see all day. It was like, I can't do this. My legs, because I grew up snow skiing, like, you know, and my, my I just could not do it. <laughs> but I tried. I, you know why I tried? Because 
One of my students, I always told them, you have to try. You have to try everything. So when we were going skiing and I wasn't skiing with them, I got called on it. So I tried. <laughs> it didn't work, but I tried. But um, so I had students who were able to snowboard. I had some teenage boys and some teenage girls that were very active. And then I had students who were visually impaired who had to have people guide them. They put reins on their skis and they guided them. I had students that had um, seizure disorders and then they would stay in like a sled and then they would get a chance to go down. So we had all levels of what our students were doing, but we did that for about four years. And there was another thing I like to do is um, I like to swim with the dolphins and I've done it in Mexico. I've done it in Honduras. Um, so the one thing we did was our students had a small business. We made these Christmas trees out of hangers, curtain hangers, and we were selling them. So we got to go on lots of field trips. We went to the beach, we went to the theater, we got all dressed up and went to um, a Christmas theater. It was really fun. But the one thing they did was, and we recycled, is they earned enough money to go swimming with the dolphins in SeaWorld. So it was this huge thing. I mean, I had to go through so much to be able to take my students down there, but my students went, almost all of my parents got to go and SeaWorld let the parents go for free. So we all went down there and they went swimming with the dolphins. And we, of course, then we spent the day in SeaWorld, but they earned their own money to do that. And I actually really had to fight. I had to fight, you know, in, in public to, to allow my students to be able to do that because they wanted to earn their own money. So we did that and all of that stuff. I have an album in my Facebook. It's awards and newspaper articles. And they, the local paper did lots of, um, of articles about that and tried to promote our students. And at that time, we started a workability program in our community. And my students actually worked in the local businesses. And they rode the city bus 45 minutes to go to the college and work in the restaurant class. They had uh, food handlers cards. And so they were able to do all of that. They were very active in the community. And so that's, that's actually what my um, dissertation was written on. We have, federal, we have federal transition goals, which at the age of 16, we start teaching our children, our students, um, life skills, making sure they have work skills. Um, they can ride city buses. They can, you know, making them as independent as possible because the more independent we make them in public education, then the higher program they're gonna go into. They could go into a work program or a social program or dependent on their level. So that's actually, you know, something I do as my day job. <laughs> that's something I do all of the time. It's just, it's just part of my life. Mm. And so actually yesterday was our last day of school. And as I said, our classes are specialized. So students come into our classroom who have behaviors or need extra academic help or they have medical conditions. And I was actually able to move after having three years, two of my students who worked really hard back up into the district. So they kind of promoted back up and they're gonna to go to the high school and not have a self-contained classroom. So that's like a really big thing for, for our classes to be able to do Isn't that. It? So um, wow. I'm working on two more right now, but that's like a really amazing thing that they were able to do that. So um, that was something we got to do. I also lecture at the local university. I teach, um, last year I taught case law, special ed case law. And I also teach the new teachers that are coming in. I also um, mentor some of the new teachers in, in the county schools, which is where I work. Mm. I also go up and I work with Sacramento. I help, um, we have standardized tests and I help develop those with the education department and the testing service. We are, I'm on committees. I've been going about once a month for several years. Um, so during COVID, we did it, we did it during Zoom, but we create the test questions or we analyze them or we review them. Um, I've been to, on standard setting, I, you know, I've done, and I, and it's a lot of work, and I, but I really like doing it because I'm up there advocating for my students, you know, all of, you know, not just my personal students, but the students in the state of California. And so we're up there and we're debating with science teachers and, you know, math teachers and how can we make this accessible for our students. And sometimes it gets pretty heated, you know, because everybody's, you know, fighting for what they believe in. But we need to make sure that our students can access the test and do and do well with it. And so that's, I do a lot of that. Um, so another thing that I do, which uh, you might be able to send your book if you'd like, I started getting connected with an educational magazine called Story Monster. 
And that's what this guy is. All of my books are story monster approved. <laughs> and they're out of Tempe, Arizona. And so before COVID hit, I was going there a lot. And it's about a six, seven hour drive. But I would drive there and do events with them. And I, they're just like the most wonderful people. And they're another set of group of people that I met during this time that, that someone was hurting me. And so she was, they were very helpful. They're very supportive. And the one thing I do is I write book reviews for them. So I'm waiting to get a new box of books. So I get to go through all the books and then I read them to my class and we write book reports. And then um, I give them to my students when I'm done, but I write book reviews. They're published in the magazine. I also judge the children's literacy contests that they have. I do not judge my own books. <laughs> I judge other people's and um, I do that. And another thing that I started doing after listening to Kwame was they were looking for judges, literary judges for romance books. It's Indie Tale Magazine. And so I've been doing that, I think this is my fourth or fifth year. So that was the only, people ask me, what do you like to read? I don't get to read. I mean, my brain is so tired. If I sit down, I try to read a page or two and then I'm done, you know, because I am so busy going 20 different directions. So I thought, okay, I love to read. So this is going to make me read. So Beginning of every summer, I read four or five romance books and I have to judge them and everything, but they're always sweet romance and I love them. They're easy reads. And, you know, <laughs> and so I do that and I judge their contests and then she, um, I get a little promotion in their magazine for doing that, but it's a lot of fun. It's the only way I get to read you know, that's not technical. You know, that that's your own happen. version of Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I oh, love it. No. <laughs> You know, when people ask me, like, well, what kind of, like, movies do you like and all yeah. that? Okay, when, when I was growing up, I was in the third grade, and I had trouble reading. So my dad sat down with me every single night to help me learn to read. Okay. And then I love reading. So growing up, I like Nancy Drew, the Boxcar oh, Children, oh, oh. the Outsiders, you know, all of that. Well, then when I became a teenager, I started liking the horror flicks. You know, Freddy Krueger and <laughs> all the slasher movies. Okay, so now that I'm a little older, we won't talk about how old, <laughs> a little older. I'm kidding. Two weeks, I'll be 58. <laughs> oh. um, I started liking the criminal, like the criminal minds and law and order and all of those. I love the profiling part of it, mm. how they can go into someone's house and look around mm. and figure out who they are. You know, and then you look at your house, and you're like, I wonder if they came in here, what they <laughs> what they would say, you know, but I just love those kind of things. Um, mm. And so. Okay, so back to the books, though. <laughs> okay, this one, I during the pandemic, that is one thing since I couldn't travel around and do book signings and book events anymore, which I really love the interacting with the children. I decided I was, because I had a goal when I first started, I wanted to publish one book a year because I, I travel a lot. Like I could write until I'm 200, you know, but I'm going to publish one a year. And so I, of course, got off track of that. So during the pandemic, this is what I did. I just put out my third book. We're working on the illustrations on the fourth one. And this summer I'm, I'm going to research a, another one. But this is one I did. I did it last year. And it's based on, there's a train that goes from the mountains to the Grand Canyon. And we did it over Thanksgiving. And this is all my family that went. <laughs> there was 19 of us on this train ride. <laughs> this is actually a picture of my grandson. After we went on the train, we came back. He's seven now, so this is a couple of years ago. But after we went on the train, he came back and we went on Polar Express. We came back, put our jammies Excellent. on, went Excellent. on the Polar Express. And again, um, the, age, the ages were probably 77 to maybe four at that time. I'm not sure how old Blake was. He might've been younger than that. And so we all went on this and we were really tired, but this is where this book came from. It's a pre-K to first grade. This one is a picture of my grandson. A bandit came and he robbed us. <laughs> and so this is, he actually held my grandsons up like this. So this is a picture of him. And then the first the man that's in here is actually one of my assistants in my classroom. I put him in my book. This one are my boys. They're hanging over the Grand Canyon. And when we were there, it was snowing. And, um, but all I could see was them and I could see them hanging over. 
And so I, of course, I was like, I can't watch this. Oh, what are you doing? Well, there was a ledge right underneath them. So they weren't in any kind of danger at all. So they thought it was funny that they scared us. But um, so this is where this picture came from. But this is all about our train ride. And see, it was snowing. And so we did that. So this is the one that I just published. I think it was last, last May, so about a year ago. And the tra book trailer for this is one that just got entered into the film festivals. So when I go in July, they're going to play the book trailer on the movie screen during the festival. So I'm really excited about that. So this one is based on New Orleans. I went to New Orleans and had a wonderful time. I went for my birthday one year and we went into the bayou twice and we went in a jet boat. Uh -huh. And it was actually thundering and lightning. And so we had to hide under the moss until it stopped. But our guy, there was probably about, I don't know, six of us on the boat, I think. And he just went up on this like grass knoll and he gets out and he's got the fish and he starts making this really weird noise. <laughs> and then you see these eyes, these huge eyes coming up out of the water like you do in the movies. It really happens. <laughs> and the, so the alligators were coming up and he was feeding them and he was probably three feet from me and the alligators were probably a foot, foot and a half from him. <laughs> so, yeah. And so okay. he turns around and he hands, hands me a baby alligator. He just picks it up and hands it to me and I'm holding it. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so fascinated. And I'm just petting his stomach. And um, so when, when I put the picture on my Facebook, somebody says, well, you know, they bite. And I'm like, I didn't even think about that when I was holding him because it was just so neat. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm holding a baby alligator in a bayou. You uh, know, and so this that's where this picture came from. And then this book is uh, fifth or sixth grade. It has has plantations and jazz music and it touches on slavery and the Underground Railroad. So some of the information in here could be a little sensitive um, to others, but it's it's uh, factual information. And then this is a white alligator that was there. And so and all of the pictures from my tripper, they're all in my Facebook. And so we want to go back a little bit and talk about maybe some darkness. So this is what I wrote after um, I was done being stalked. I ended up having to sell my home and um, just it was just pretty bad. But what I did was I wrote this book about it and it kind of helped me heal a little bit. And I just published it. I actually wrote it three years ago. I was sitting in the sheriff's office. And he confirmed who was doing it to me. And he tried, he tried to help me. We were unable to stop her, so I had to sell my house. But um, I took a trip with my, with my friend. She was my assistant in my classroom. She's been my friend for over 20 years. And so she was helping me through all this. And so on the way to Vegas, we went to Vegas for the weekend to rest. We wrote this story in our heads on the way there after talking to the sheriff. She was sitting in the office with me. So on the drive there, we wrote this story. And when I got to Vegas, I scratched it all out of my notebook. I wrote it all out. So we wrote it right then and there. But it took me three years to feel safe enough to actually publish it. And so I did. It just came out a couple of months ago. And um, I actually read it on a podcast from the UK. It's called Bedtime Stories. And it was trending in the UK for a little while. So this one actually was accepted into the film festival, too the book and the video, the book trailer. So it's gonna be played too. So this is the one I like, I let other people read, but it's just a story about the dragon because she called me a dragon slayer. So she's, so she's the dragon. <laughs> and um, it's just the story of what she did about how she um, is lying and telling people things like she's helping them when she's actually hurting them. And how the king discovers that she's the person doing this. Like, you know, I'm giving the plot away. <laughs> she's the person that's um, discovering it. And he van vanquishes her from the kingdom and she goes away. And then life is nice again. And everybody's happy and the and everything flourishes. But it's, it's just a lesson on um, not hurting people when you're jealous or angry. And it's just not okay on hurting people. So it's a really good life lesson for the little ones. Definitely. And it seems to be being received very well. So I'm glad I finally got to publish it. But it's different from the Queen Vernita books. It's still based on something that happened to me. Um, and it's still based on the kingdom. It kind of has the kingdom of quails, which this is. But um, so that's where that came from. And so do you have any other questions? Any questions yet? 
<laughs> I can I can keep going. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. It's beautiful because to see your passion. And to see the energy uh, that is emanating from you, to the, the aura of yours, it is you have you have turned your life experiences into into books, and you have become very good in teaching. But being a teacher myself, every single time I'm teaching, I am learning about myself i'm learning in a, in a very different level i in order to teach something you have to research it now that's what you do with your with your books but you also have to research your own feelings you have you, you have to relive what is actually occurring so for you to write this book about the stalking for example would have been not easy because it would have brought up a hell of a lot of things and it's easy to to get drawn back into the darkness so to make it negative yeah exactly exactly right to actually turn that into not a positive experience but into something that you can work with and teach now that is a beautiful because what you have created is a starting point for a discussion you have created something that you certainly can talk about people who are manipulative, who are gaslighting, who are psychopaths, yes. sociopaths, which after all, 1% of the population are psychopaths and sociopaths. And 10% of the population have got personality disorders. So it is virtually a given that in your lifetime, you will come across yes. someone who will therefore try to hurt you or... Um, will hurt you and just doesn't give a damn about it because they right. don't perceive things like that. So right. therefore you are actually arming any family who uses your book to as a as bedtime reading or a story reading, story time, you're actually arming them with a tool to discuss the not so nice things. And that yeah. is powerful, powerful. It was really interesting. I, I gave this book to um, a lady. She was looking for books to read on her Instagram. And I said, here, go ahead and read this. You know, I've been kind of letting people just read this one, hoping to um, get more attention for the rest of my series yeah. and the new books I'm coming out. So she actually did it on Instagram on Saturday and it's on my Facebook and it's perfect. It's like exactly what you want parents to be doing with their children when they're reading the book. Uh, her little boy was six, she said, and they, he was going through it and he was problem, problem solving. They were going through vocabulary lessons. He was, you know, oh, the king should do this. The, oh, the dragon shouldn't do this. And at the very end, it was funny. He said, he said, well, I don't think the dragon really meant to hurt anybody. And I thought, okay, so he's, he's processing the information. He's coming up with his own conclusion. I know she did, <laughs> but that's Okay. You know, but just if you go on my Facebook and you listen to it, that's exactly what, well, a teacher, an author wants people doing with their books, their exactly. lessons. They want them discussing them. He, they talked about the book the whole way through it. And he was very eager. And I mean, it, it was just, I just loved it. I just gave her another book to read with him. And it's like, it's perfect. Exactly what I want parents doing. I don't want them just reading the book. You know, I want them going through it. Why did they exactly. do this? And he had this whole scenario at first that the dragon, the king was going to have a net and put the dragon's favorite food in it. And then he would lure the dragon in there and catch the dragon. <laughs> and then he's like, well, why didn't the king use the guards to help them? And, and it was just really interesting listening to him go through the problem solving and the answers. And, and then at the end, what his conclusion was of the story. And, you know, it was, you know, the dragon's sad now and, and it was just, it was perfect. <laughs> perfect. Well, that's, that's exactly how we grow healthy young people. Mm -hmm. We don't just pretend that the world is so shiny and beautiful. Right. And then they get hurt. And then they have no skills how to deal with the pain. Mm -hmm. And then they get, they distract themselves with drugs or un, uh, unhealthy behaviors, etc. So you are empowering young people to grow into resilient human beings. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And something that came clearly out of darkness for you. 
but here you are. I mean, to, you're you're changing your own life story and make a transforming it into a lesson. You take catalysts that were painful, but you actually turn them around into a weapon in your own hands with which you can beat this darkness, slash the darkness. So the dragon right. slayer yeah. is a good picture there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah she, that's what she called me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well it's, it will forever be tinged in a negative uh, for you. <laughs> Having said that, here, Queen Vernita, there must be a dragon slayer there somewhere. Come on. <laughs> oh, I can tell you stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. No, and that's, that's beautiful. I mean, that is... That is the amazing thing. You have, whilst you were, of course, your mind was always working like that. How can you teach in in a non-typical way? So you you were primed to create an empire like that. Um, <laughs> but uh, at the same token, it took catalysts. It took the the separation, the divorce for you to feel so much pain, to be so uncomfortable and out of your comfort zone that you actually took action. And that action turned for you. He was making you. some, yeah, some yeah. really bad decisions and he went one way and I was like, I'm not going that way with you. I'm mm -hmm. going this way. And that's when I actually started my PhD. Mm -hmm. um, actually, my brother, my brother is the one who encouraged me to try it. Cause you know, when I was growing up, my, mo my mom was a kindergarten teacher. And mm -hmm. so when I was, uh, my, when my girls were very little, I was going to junior college and I was taking a class called a co-op class where you could get credit for volunteering or what you were working. So I'd volunteer in her classroom and get college credit because I had a bunch of little kids, you know, and my husband, you know, we didn't have very much money. So he was working all the time and he was also trying to go to school too, to be a fireman. And so I would take my, take my girls to class and they would be there with me and I would work with my mom and it's just a way of incorporating um, everything I've done. Um, when I was teaching, I was always on the same campuses as my children. And they would come over and sit with, with me and my students and have lunch. And so it's all kind of like just all stuck together. You know, it's, it, it all just mm -hmm. flows together. And that's just, yeah, that's just how I started all of this. And it's beautiful. And I guess that the, the big lesson there is to be open to be open to opportunities and that's so important as I, I remember back i had quite a while ago i had cq um microcast keo on my my program as a guest cq was on on the receiving end of some metal that the enemy slugged at him and it didn't answer well so his ptsd as a soldier caught up with him and he was in a very 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 dark place for a long time and then finally, he allowed himself to be open. And so when, when uh, his peers sort of said, hey, look, we are learning about X. Do you want to come along? Do you want to learn how to play golf? Yeah, why not? So he learned how to play golf. And uh -huh. then one day, one day they said, hey, there's a, there's a uh, comedy class uh, there. Do you want to come along? And they said, yeah, why not? I come along. So he opened himself up to absolutely everything. He said yes. yes. <laughs> exactly. And nowadays he's a comedian and is living such a different life. Mm -hmm. uh, but it came from his final, final, oh, he, he broke down the walls that kept yeah. him in his own prison. And he, he was able to step out of himself and say, yeah, okay, it is, is the old the old me is not so nice. I I admit that, and it has gone through a lot of shit. But let's actually see what's what's the new me. Who am I really? And this is the key to be open to new challenges. And you never know what right. will happen. You don't know. It? You don't know what opportunity will lead to another opportunity, or who you're going to run into. Um, one time. My brother and I were doing a book reading at an elementary school. I did the kindergartners mm. and then he was doing the third graders. So he had a second assembly and I was standing in the back. And so he was just talking about me and who I was and what I did. And this little boy 
starts talking. He said, my sister was in one of your classes, not, not my personal class, but one of our classes, but she had just passed away. And so he started talking about the class and his sister and everything. And then afterwards, the teachers told us that he hadn't talked in weeks after she passed away. That was the first time he'd actually opened up about it. And here he was, just because I was standing there doing this book reading about the calendar skills, and my brother was talking about astronomy, he was able able to k- kind of work with it a little bit and, you know, and find some peace for himself, this poor little boy. And so, you know, we gave him a set of the books and took pictures and everything. But when I went there, I never imagined that that's what would be the impact, you know? So that's what I always tell people. It's like, you think you're doing this, what you're, whatever you're doing, you think this is why you're doing it, but you don't know who you're going to impact. You don't know who you're going to connect with or what it is that you're doing or saying that's going to resonate inside of them. And so you, I kind of warn people, you kind of got to be careful what you're doing or saying also, because you don't know who's listening or what they're, you know, what they're getting out of it. And, you know, I did, when I first started, when this one came out, I had a friend I grew up with and she lived in Long Island in New York. She bought a set of this for all of her, her son was in kindergarten for all the kindergartners. And so my mom and I flew out there and did the book reading. And then I did one, they had a bookstore on Long Island and I was doing it. And a man was standing in the back and he was a doctor. And he said that my son, his son reads this book every single night. And it has, it's the repetitiousness of the books that are great for people who have learning disabilities or they have autism, you know, that kind of thing. It's it's a good format for learning factual information, math, science, history. Um, some people, they pick up the books and they think it's like a story, like a bedtime story. It's not, they're, they're educational and adventuresome. And I did an interview um, for someone, I think he was in St. Louis and he said he was talking to his friend and his friend knew who I was. She had been checking the books out in the library and her and her son had been reading them. And because of the books, she got a second job and she is going to take him traveling. I didn't even know my books were in the library there. So (laughs) much less that I was impacting these two people. So you, you know, you don't know who's out there. You don't know. We just had Bunko at my house, a bunch of ladies. It's just this dice game. And this lady's like, why do you have that up there? You know, and I was like, well, that's, you know, those are my books. And I started talking about my books. And she says, I've been buying your books because my mom's name is Virgin- Vernita. My mom's name is Virginia. Her mom's name is Vernita. And so she's like, you live up here. I live in a small town. She goes, I didn't know you lived up here. You know? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's like we're in Bunko together. So she bought another book. But, you know, you just you just never know you know, who you're going to meet or what you're doing or so I do warn people, you know, you just kind of got to be careful what you're doing and saying, but um, there's one thing about kind of some darkness, the lady that, that does the conquering disabilities film festival, the director of it, the reason she has it now, it's kind of new. I think it's only two or three years old, but she actually is, has bipolar. And what she started doing was writing, writing it down, writing her journey down. And then she started a blog. And then from the blog, it became a book. And now it's, she's made it into a, some movies. They're indie movies. But now she's the director of this film festival. Uh-huh. Um, and she's right now, she's traveling like all over the place, winning like all of these awards. She's just in, um, oh, now I can't think of where she was. But I mean, she's just going all over. And that would not have happened for her if she had not started writing her journey down. Hmm if she had not been brave enough to talk about it, because it is hard. It's hard to go out in public and talk about what's happened to you, you know, but maybe, you know, maybe the bottom line of the, the dragon thing that happened to me, but maybe it happened to me so I can write this book and I can impact other people, you know, because someone could be listening to this podcast and they're being gaslighted or they're being stopped. And the one thing I learned was that there's a lot more people who are stalked than you would think. Mm. It's a lot more common than you think it is. Mm. And there's a lot of more people who have had to sell their homes. I thought that's Mm. just the stupidest thing that that I have to sell my own home because these people, they were getting into my house. No matter what I did, they were getting into my house. And, 
you know, vandalizing my house. And we didn't even figure out who it was until I actually like where they, they knew my neighbors and my neighbors were not the best people. So they were coming in, but, you know, but after this happened, you know, even my own family really didn't understand what was happening to me, you know, because I was being gaslighted Uh and that just messes up your head, (laughs) you know, Uh and then that's the purpose of it. But that's one thing that people have to understand is that if someone's doing that to you, the purpose of it is to mess with your mind (laughs) and they think it's fun. It's entertainment for them. So the one thing I did when I was, the sheriff told me, that someone had a vendetta against me and she, she didn't want me to, to move. She wanted to catch these people so I wouldn't have to move. She said, you shouldn't have to move, which is of course correct, but I did. Mm. But the one thing that I did, yeah. kind of my, you know, whatever to them is I had these beautiful morning gro- glories and this ivy and I would go out every morning before I went to work and I would take a picture of them blooming and I would always post them on, um, on my social media. And I would say, good morning, beautiful world with these beautiful flowers. And it was kind of my, you know what? I know you're doing this to me, but you aren't going to change my life. You know, you know, you're not going to become the center of this. You're irritating me and you're scaring me and you're being really stupid. But this is my life and you can't take my life from me. And that's something people have to remember that if someone is doing something bad to you and The same thing with my divorce. He was making bad decisions, but he couldn't take my life from me. You know, I worked hard to be a teacher. I'm I'm a good teacher. And he couldn't take that from me, though he he tried. Um, He couldn't take my family from me, my adventures, um, what I was doing in my life, um, sharing with the world. Like, he couldn't dim my light. He, you know, and either could this other lady. They couldn't dim me. This is who I am. And I fought back. And but maybe the purpose of all that was maybe somewhere out there in the world, it's, you know, it's being read in the UK and I don't even know, Philippines. Oh, and I can't think of the countries now that, have, that, that they've told me that they're listening to the story. But you don't know who you're going to impact. Maybe someone out there is going through something and they don't even understand what it is they're going through. But they might hear me talk and go, oh, that's happening to me. <laughs> uh Oh, you know, and so you don't know. You really don't know. And that's exactly it, isn't it? It is uh, the moment you open yourself up. That also includes open yourself up to new insights. And as you say, you might recognize yourself in a situation. How many people are down and out and have no idea that they suffer from depression? Um, they are angry, they're resentful, there is so much. And if you look at them neutrally, you think uh, you are bombed or depressed. No, I'm not. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's this kind of, no, no, I, I could never be like that. Or uh, similar, uh, other other emotions. Uh, a friend of mine, she is uh, she's bipolar, but uh, she has not yet accepted that fact Yet I met her in in a in a, recently in a really really beautiful high, and she was she was gorgeous in what she achieved, and she was out there bang 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 bang, <laughs> and no surprisingly now she's going through another phase, right. and indeed indeed right, yes. and it is it is hard for me to watch that because I can see it so clearly. Yet for her she hasn't got the insight, but books like yours allow yourself to be at the children's level and to actually reflect without your your brain knowing that you're reflecting on it. So there is another level there. It's not just a book that is, or books that are valuable for children. They can just as much be valuable for the grown-ups who are reading these stories to the children because they might reflect on things in their own life. And suddenly them reading that book to to the grandchild or to the child might suddenly make them think, huh, and might start their own journey, the mm-hmm. journey that is often coming from a place of pain. And and what do we do with pain? We will try to bury it as deep inside yes. as possible. Keep ourselves and that's busy. That's not a good idea. That is not. <laughs> a, it comes out. It's going to come out. It's going to come out. 
Exactly. So your books are uh, like modern children films. There is the, the obvious, uh, the obvious children level in Shrek, and then there's the grown up <laughs> level in yeah. Shrek. And so <laughs> you're perfect. watching it like, did they just say that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. And the children. Shush. Was it the cat in the hat one too? There's oh, yeah. a lot of adult stuff in that oh. one. It's like. Exactly. exactly. Really? <laughs> love it. Love it. And that's that's uh, that made me again enjoy children's books. Now, your books are exactly doing that. Your books can rattle cages. And that's where they are so powerful because you you address taboos to a certain degree. You uh, address very negative emotions that can be there. And by, but they don't have to stay there. That I mean, that's the point of all of it is you don't stay there. Exactly. You don't stay there. You you keep fighting. You keep mm-hmm. fighting back. You find your passions. Mm-hmm. You find what's in your heart, and you fight back with it. I mean, you don't fight them because they don't. They don't really care. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they really don't care. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and it and it makes them happy that you're upset or that you're this mm-hmm. or that. I mean, it really makes them happy. But you fight back for yourself. Mm-hmm. Now. Um, and it also it also teaches about friendship and adventure mm-hmm. and you know the one I just published it just came out like two weeks ago so I don't even have a copy of it yet we, we we go up to the central coast and we go camping it's called Halama Beach so I needed some more pre K books to read to classes and to read for book readings so I decided to write that one on our camping trips so on the camping trip we make s'mores and we go kite flying. And there's an ostrich farm we went to, and it has ostrich and emu. There's raccoons. Um, there, you know, and so it's just a fun little. It's going to be great for the summer. But you know, someone might be sitting there even even now, like, okay, we're. I don't know how you guys are doing, but we're starting to lift. We're starting to get out and about, and hopefully it will stay okay. You know, I got vaccinated. I'm still here. Yes. I didn't more. I didn't morph into a robot or anything. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> but, and we didn't catch it. And th- that's one thing we did. My children are all in their 30s now. But during this, they planned camping trips. So about once a month, we all went somewhere and went camping. And then we got to really be together and be outside. And we were careful. We, you know, nobody, um, my brother, which I will get to in a second, but my older brother did catch it. But the rest of us, um, we camped and, but we were careful and things, some things were closed, but we still got out there, got in the sunshine, spent time together. And um, thankfully my children um, were in charge of all of that. So I guess I raised them really well. But my older brother also, he was fine until he went to college. And then um, schizophrenia manifested itself for whatever reason, that's when it came out. Mm -hmm. So my brother is very disabled and he lives in a home. And it's got quite a few people. It must have over 2000 people in this in this complex. Well, the COVID got into there. And so he was moved out and he was in a rehab center for, I think, oh my gosh, I think it was two months. So at first we would, I had to drive my mom because, you know, they didn't even really tell her um, because he's, he's, um, he's 60 now where he was. And so we had to find him and then we had to go down there and we only could look at him through the window, but okay, he's still alive. He's okay. And he actually didn't get it. He had it, but he didn't get any symptoms. So he had to stay in there in this COVID unit and this quarantine. And so we drove an hour almost every day for a while to go because my mom was not happy. And but he was married and his wife also caught it. But she had some underlying conditions and she actually passed away within a day of it. But she was in a different center. And so a month after him being he was asking, like, where did she go? Um, and we had to go look for her and she had passed away. I had to call the hospital. We had to find out what happened to her. They had already cremated her. So um, we, we, we had to go through all of that. But so, you know, we got impacted that. And my family's impacted by a disability that didn't manifest itself until he was older. I mean, when he graduated from high school, he was a, a salutatorian, the valid salutatorian he was, salutatorian. And, you know, he's still he's still underneath um, all of the other things that are happening for him. He's still highly, highly intelligent. And 
he's funny. Like he, he likes to call us on things. It's funny. <laughs> you know, he just did it. And all of a sudden, you know, he catches what you're talking about or whatever. It's, it's, you know, it's interesting, but so he's had a really hard life, you know, really hard. And we thought that if he caught COVID, he would be the one that like wouldn't make it because he, he has a lot of physical issues mm-hmm. and he didn't even get any symptoms. So, you know, you never know, you never know what's going to happen. But um, this book is based on Mexico. And these are some of the things, this is us swimming. Um, my daughter and I, and my mom, we went, we were in Estapa and we went swim with the dolphins and we, we actually rode the dolphins like this. And we had two dolphins and they put their noses on your toes and they pushed us out of the water. And so it was a lot of fun. And this one, we were camping in a place called El Golfo, Mexico. I bet nobody's ever heard of it. <laughs> but um, we were sitting there and everybody's running around the beach. And we're like, what are they doing? Well, there was a, the grunion were running. And so they were all out there catching the grunion. So we started doing that. And then so they started um, cooking them. I did not eat them. I don't like fish, but every other people were doing things with them. And so um, the pictures of that camping trip, they're in my Facebook and um, we went, we went for Thanksgiving. We went on a cruise and my, my grandchildren, I think I had only one grandchildren at the time, but my brother, my older brother who, who is disabled was with us. And so we went on this family rafting trip, which should have been really easy. <laughs> and cause he, you know, he isn't very healthy. So my son and I were in the front and my mom and my brother were in the back. Well, the, our guide was from Peru and he'd never been on, we were in Acapulco, never been on this river before. So, and the water was really low because it was November. So the boat, one of the other boats got a hole in it. And so some of the people had to go on our boat and they didn't know how to, how to do this at all. They were doing the opposite of what we were doing. They were causing us lots of problems. And the, and the guide wasn't familiar with the river. So we ended up pushed against this huge rock. Well, I was on the bottom and everybody and the current was pushing everybody against me. And the people were climbing out of the rock. But I was getting pushed underneath the rock. So I let go. I let go. And I went down the rapids and spun around. I mean, I can still remember it over my head. And when I turned up and I popped up, I saw my son standing on top of the rock. And he's, my mom said she asked him where I went. And he's like, she's right there. <laughs> but he's like, turn around. So I, I listened to him and I turned around because if you go down the river, back first you're going to hit a rock and you could you know break your back or whatever so feet first went there you know they're blowing the whistles and they come and rescue me and and everything and so we got back to the ship everywhere we went you could hear people talking did you you hear about the lady that fell out of the boat did you i'm just like oh my god so i was the talk of the boat (laughs) luckily they didn't really put that person with me you know they didn't put it together but um i used to (laughs) Now I realize how dumb it was, but I used to say, I'm not going to die on my way to work. I'm going to die doing something fun. And then after that, I stopped saying that because I really didn't want to die, (laughs) you know, and, um, but it was, it was an adventure, but it's in my book. And this one, we went quad riding in Mexico. And so that is in there. And we went kayaking to the Labufadora. So we went out in the ocean to see it from the ocean side. So this is in the book. And we went to a German eatery. We went out, um, I think we were in Cabo when we did this. We went out in the ocean and we were swimming with the seal. There was a seal there and he was swimming with us, lots of fun. And this one, this one is a friend of mine. Her name is Claudia and she has a therapy dog. And so this page is on Claudia and Harper Lee and Harper Lee's been to my classroom and visited us. And my, my, my students just loved her. She's just wonderful. And this, of course, is about therapy dogs and service dogs. And she actually takes her dog and her. They do a reading program with uh, the little kids in the libraries and the schools. And she also goes to the L.A. airport and she helps soothe the passengers, her, her and Harper Lee. So she's been on the news and everything. So it's really exciting. But she was kind enough to be in my book. So that's what this one on. So there's lots and lots of different kinds of information in my books. Which is amazing. It is. And isn't it from author to author, isn't it beautiful how one thing leads to the other, how you suddenly become thirsty to, to, to 
do something else, something, some mm-hmm. other thoughts come into your mind. Where, where oh, yeah. do you get the inspiration from? Where's the most dangerous place for you to be? Um, where inevitably there is an idea coming into your head. Do they come from, <laughs> from everywhere or? Um, they, well, okay. So we went camping this whole year. So we went to Zion, the Grand Canyon, the yeah. Sequoias. So, you know, those are going to be in books. Sure. So we're just living our lives and, you know, right. Some of my children, my grandchildren, they rode their bicycles over the rim, on top of the rim. Yeah. So, okay, that'll be that'll be a page. The rest <laughs> of us tried to tried to walk down this this I trail, I which apparently um, we didn't realize it's like one of the most strenuous trails um, in the Grand Canyon, and so we didn't make it that far. But that's oh. going to be on there. Um, and then we stayed at a KOA, so we went uh, go kart riding. That'll be in there. <laughs> we went swimming. You know. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's automatic, oh, then, automatic. Yeah. Your brain is already yeah. working like that. Oh yeah. That, yeah. So oh, I'm like, awesome. okay guys, you know, yeah. and so my, my family's getting kind of used to all of this now and the, and the information yeah. and that they're yeah. out there. In fact, I'm going to do an interview in July and my oldest granddaughter is going to join me and talk about being in yes. the books. Yes. She's, uh, she's in this one. She's like, grandma, when do I get to talk with you? And I'm like, okay, if you want to, but this is this is when she was little. She was little. She was my first grandbaby. And so she's in several of my my first books. Uh, and her brother, and I'm gonna get him on there too on a show. But we went, we were trying to do for a while was going up the coast where there was the ocean was red and then at night it glowed blue. Mm-hmm. So we went to the sea, to the ocean, like three different times to try to catch it. And like, we'd be one place and it would be 30 miles down there. So I never got to see the blue part so that's still on my lip, but I did, I did see the red, but that was during the, during the quarantine. And so my mom and um, one of our occupational therapists was from Maine and she was living with me. And so seeing the ocean and all that was new. So we took her down there with us and my grandson. And at that time you couldn't even sit on the beach like the lifeguards would come and yell at you you couldn't sit you had to keep walking you had to be exercising so we walked down the beach and my grandson swam in the ocean beside us <laughs> so they're actually I have they're actually in the book I just published so she was walking and all of a sudden this huge jellyfish came up in the water where we were walking and so she's dancing around it trying not to step on it so that's a page in the book so I took her dancing around and him swimming in the ocean and the jellyfish and there was a, a bird or, and so all of that is in the page. So that's how I incorporate like going there. I was going there to see the blue glow and didn't get to see it, but we saw all this other stuff that I put in the book. <laughs> so it's just like when you go, you know, when you yeah. go to the Grand Canyon, you think, yeah. okay, I know what I want to write about, but you get there and I like to write about things that are unknown like a little animal that nobody really knows a lot about or a a historical fact or something like that. And the one I'm working on now, I have a co-author. He's someone I've known since I was 16. And we actually were in a car accident together um, when we were teenagers. And so I, I broke my femur and my pelvis and my sternum and spent six months in a body cast and stuff when I was a junior in high school, that's what I got to do. But he actually found my brother because we worked for the school district and we reconnected and we started this book 10 years ago and we just finished it because he used to live in Tucson. So he loves the desert. So this book is on the desert and he connected me with this beautiful bed and breakfast. And so we decided to make her bed and breakfast, the center of the book. And it's just gorgeous. (laughs) And so we're going on an adventure from her, from her bed and breakfast so, and that one, we're, we're about halfway done with the illustration. So it, I'm sure, I'm thinking it'll be out by Christmas, maybe. Um, but then this summer, I'm going to go to Wyoming and go visit. She used to be my best friend. She passed away um, in her 30s, but her family moved to Wyoming. So my mom and I are going to go to Wyoming and research a book that her dad wants to write with me. And one of the things that I wanted to do was stay, there's a haunted hotel in town. So my mom and I are going to stay in the haunted hotel. So, you know, that's either going to be the center of the book or at least a big part of it. It matters how much is there because I don't know. I haven't been there yet. But a couple of years ago, we went, I think we were in North Dakota. I don't even know where we were, (laughs) but we were, uh, we went to one of the national parks and there was all these cars over there. And I'm like, mom, let's go over there and see what they're doing. Huge herd of buffalo huge were there so we're we're parked and they start coming across 
right in front, like right in front of us. And if you've never seen a buffalo, they're huge. They're massive and they're very impressive. There was all the big ones and the, the babies. And so we we're like rolling up the window, like that's going to stop them from coming in. But, you know, it made us feel a little better. But I mean, the videos, the videos on my Facebook too, you know, and so that's going to be in there. But the one thing we saw was after the, uh, the buffalo left the field, all these little prairie dogs popped up because they were all hiding because the buffalo were on top of their homes. So that's going to be inside of it too. So when I went there, that is not why I went there was, I didn't even know I was going to see that. You know, so you don't know what you're going to see. You go with an idea. It's just really any book you do. You, you have this idea. This is what I'm doing. And then you go this way and then you kind of go that way. You know, you have to be able to go with the flow and, and what you run into. And so that's going to be the next book I research. Guys, <laughs> you have just heard the key sentence in the whole interview. You never know what you run into. And you just have to go with the flow, <laughs> ultimately. <laughs> But you have to take action. You have to be open and you have to take action. And if you do that, if you actually expose yourself to such an experience, you will change. You will transform. You will grow. You will, you will not be the same person than you were just moments before whatever has occurred. Right. What a beautiful thing is that. What a beautiful explosion of growth, of the, you suddenly find yourself challenged. You need to adapt. You need to rethink. And is that not beautiful? Is that not not the, the plasticity with which we want to be open to live our life? Do you really want to be as rigid? Do you really want to be as close-minded Uh, or do you actually want to say, okay, I have lived my life this long so far and see where it got me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not so many great points there. Who do I really want to be when I grow up? Who you know, when I graduated me? from high school, I was taking business classes and, and I thought I was, I was going to have my own business. And, you know, that was my drive. And I'm not going to stay home and take care of my kids. And but, so what happened? I met, I met my ex-husband, had three babies in five years and I stayed home <laughs> because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted yeah. to be with them. Yeah. And, and then I went to college and did that. But when I started going to college, I was like, well, maybe, maybe I can be a preschool teacher. Like I didn't even know, like if I had known when I was 19, I was going to have my PhD. I was going to be teaching students with severe cognitive delays. I was going to be working at a college. Uh, I was going to be working with the state. I was going to be writing these books. No, <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. I'd be talking to someone in another country about my adventures. No, no. Exactly. And you know how, how hard it was to start doing that too, is to start, especially I really started when all this bad stuff was happening and it was really hard because you don't know if you're out there, if it's going to start again, or if you're going to trigger somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, you don't know. And so it was really hard for me to start getting out there. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of anxiety, a, a lot of everything. I was, it was, I was very rigid when I first started like, okay, mm -hmm. this, you know, and Over the pandemic, that's one thing I really focused on was um, doing a lot more networking and getting out there. And so it's getting easier and easier to talk about it. And I'm not, I'm less afraid of somebody starting to hurt me again, you know, and I'm stronger now too. Um, I built, you know, I built a good thing with my books and that's one thing they kind of went after was my books and my books are really personal. So it's not like you're, you're stealing my ideas. You're stealing my life. <laughs> and Center. That's, you know, that's, that's a whole nother thing, but yeah, it's taken a while to get strong enough to get out there and say, you know what, here I am again. Um, but I'm enjoying it and, um, and I'm having a lot of fun and guys, I'm what an interview, uh, here I've got Dawn Mensch who transformed, uh, into this woman who is unstoppable now to, to create all these beautiful stories that allow you to talk to your children, to talk to others, to, to reflect on yourself. So, uh, what an amazing story. And that's a story that came from, from uh, a point of darkness. So it is, you know, if Dawn, can do it. If I can come 
back out of deep, deep darkness and create light for my own life and maybe shine a little bit around me. Who says it, it's not possible for you? Who says that that the past equals the future for you? You gonna write your own book. You gonna write your own next chapter and you decide what is in that chapter. So don't don't give up, stay strong. And you guys, you can do it. So look after yourself out there. And Don, thank you so much. You really, really honored me for being on my show. Thank you so much. Thank you much. for having me. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. You guys out there, look after yourself. Bye. Bye.